You're louder than Brady. Hello. Is it working? You can hear me? Hi, Kevin. Excellent. Nice to see you. Everyone's coming in. This is great. Please bear with us. This is our first live. So, you know, technologically speaking, I am not the best. So hopefully we'll be fine. And uh, yeah, so we'll just, I guess, start with introducing ourselves, if that's if that's cool with you, Kerry. So do you want to go first? Sure. sure. So my name's Kerry Fullerton. I'm a national doctor in Ontario, Canada. And yeah, I've been practicing for 20 years. And so currently I'm in this stage of life myself with perimenopause and have personal struggles with food and body image and exercise and all of the things that I, along with culture, have rammed down my throat over the years. So those are really fun to discuss. It's near and dear to my heart. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. I'm Charlotte and I'm a registered psychotherapist. I've been in the addictions and mental health field since 2011, worked in various different areas, but have worked in eating disorders. So that's why I'm very passionate about the weight stigma piece. And I am obviously in a bigger body as well. But due to my autoimmune condition, I am in a sort of like early perimenopause. So we call it uh, premature ovarian insufficiency. So it is something that's near and dear to, to my heart as well. And, you know, currently I work with a lot of autistic and ADHD women and AFAB people. So people assigned female at birth who tend to have a lot of hormonal issues and struggle a bit more usually with the, the researchers with the transition into menopause as well. So I'm glad to, that we can have this discussion today. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, you and I talk about it off all the time. We do. So yeah, it's obviously one of my, one of my special interests because we do talk about it all the time. Yeah. 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 No, I think it's just such an important thing because we, I was just, I was just attending a, a short conference on the weekend uh, and this was one of the topics, not the weight stigma part, but the perimenopause part. And of course, the the weight management flow of the conversation was ever present. It didn't matter what they were presenting, that piece was in there. Like it is literally being like slammed in front of us nonstop and it just infuriates. Yeah. Uh, I think as an eating disorder specialist, right, like I see so much of it online with different influencers, doctors, you know, other people, right? And it's this kind of mentality of just eat less and move more, right? But the people that I, everyone in that mixture thinks, so, you know, we're, we're promoting health. And again, I'm not, I'm not saying that one thing can work for one person and not another, but it's when it's this blanket advice, right, which is kind of fueled by this weight stigma, but nobody thinks about the risk of eating disorders or disordered eating. And when we look at like, you know, the rate of eating disorders, we think that it's a young girl, white girl issue, right? Uh, but actually, if you look at like rates of bariatric surgery, um, and again, I'm not poo-pooing people who have bariatric surgery, but if you look at the rates, right, the, the highest, you know, group of people who opt for bariatric surgery are women and AFAB people at perimenopausal to sort of menopausal age group right so and yes so the full conversation but informed consent yeah. Yeah. there like we know that putting someone in a semi-starvation like that place of caloric restriction has a very negative consequence on their bone mass and like 10 to 20 percent or maybe i'm exaggerating maybe it's 10 to 12 percent but like a big part of our like lifetime bone loss is happening during perimenopause so Putting someone through bariatric surgery or any intentional weight loss program at this stage of life is a detriment to their bone. Yeah. And they need to know that. It needs to be a conversation that is being had. And no one's discussing that. It's just like, oh, no big deal. Just get the surgery. It's, it's kind of, I think the problem is, right, is that you've got the intersection of women's and APAP health has been completely disregarded for like centuries in medicine anyway. So again, the things that are associated, unless it's sort of like you're having a baby, you know, it, it, you know, whether it's autoimmune conditions, you know, hormonal issues in general are just not understood and medical training isn't adequate in, in those areas. And, you know, I think when we hit a certain age, right, it's like, oh, well, you're kind of not useful anymore. So, you know, because you're not having babies, so we're not really that interested anymore. Right. But the problem is like, we weren't, you know, we weren't living to like our 80s, 70s, 80s, you know, like, you know, a century ago, 
So again, like what we, the decisions we make now, they don't just affect us now. Like you said, they, they have implications 30 years later. Right. And when it comes to dieting with that bone loss, even in our twenties with that chronic dieting and in our thirties, it, it can already be having impacts on, on things like our bone health. Yeah. hundred percent. Yeah. Then I'm sharing with you when we're doing our little practice session, this sort of epiphany. And I mean, it's something that I say regularly and it frustrates me that, you know, when a fat people are born into and in transitioning into puberty, we accept that body composition changes are part of that transition. And it just is, right? It's not being fought, although I will say in more recent years, there has been more like don't let them gain too much weight. And, and there is some stigma that's showing up. But historically, that that time where we're entering into the feminine, you know, womanhood has been more or less embraced. And yet somehow on the other side of the same journey and the same process, it is to be fought. It is to be resisted. It is like we're supposed to take any measures necessary to make sure that that doesn't happen. And it, it's so frustrating, you know, and even with like hormone testing. And I'm, when I say hormone testing in this, I'm not talking about cortisol or thyroid or any of those things, but estrogen and progesterone, like, I can't tell you how many of my patients have been told, well, you're not in menopause. We tested your FFD. Well, perimenopause is a roller coaster of hormones that's what's causing all of these symptoms. It's this fluctuation of up and down and all around. And so when you run a blood test, you're getting one moment in time. And you don't know whether you caught that in an ovulatory cycle or an anovulatory cycle or which part of that cycle that you caught it in. And so it's just, it's absurd. And one of the presenters on the weekend said, you know, oh, we don't test girls at a young age, AFAB, to see if, to prove that they're in puberty. Mm -hmm. But somehow out the other side, when we are struggling with all the same things, mood changes, cognitive issues, body changes, sleep disturbance, all of these things, when you're in your 40s, it's suddenly supposed to be proven by lab. Absolutely. It just doesn't make sense. Well, and I think you and I can both attest, you know, to the number of clients we've probably had where they've been sent to multiple doctors for things that, you know, no one can figure out because, it, again, you know, men perimenopause, like, you know, autoimmune conditions and other, other kind of, a, you know, conditions, they affect the whole body, not just like one part of our body. And so they get sort of, you know, sent to different specialists and no one can kind of figure it out. But, but again, I had one client, right, who, who you know, not one person said, oh, I think you could be perimenopausal, right? And again, when you think about perimenopause, you know, it can start eight to 10 years before you actually go into like full stopping of your periods, right? So again, I get it all the time as someone with POI. Well, you're too young. You can't, you can't have had, you know, you can't be in perimenopause. You're still having a period all this kind of stuff, right? And actually, you know, it's having effects on my body and my weight, my, my fat distribution. And again, I think that's something to talk about as well is that, you know, there's a difference in terms of, you know, obviously we have the subcutaneous fat on our arms and legs and everything else. But when we start going into perimenopause, you know, we start getting more like, you know, visceral fats, right? With the, with the dropping in hormones and that's more hormonally driven. It's not calories in, calories out. So I see people all the time with, with disordered eating saying like, I'm eating like nothing and I'm exercising seven you know days a week and I'm actually not losing weight. And I'm actually in some cases have gained weight. What am I doing wrong? And actually it's because again, we're not little men and we, we have different like things that happen in perimenopause. Can you speak to that like a bit more in, from a naturopath perspective? I mean, there's so many things that influence fat distribution, mm -hmm. right? And we know that the fat in certain parts of our body have different associations with different conditions, um, at, which is why the blanket statement of like increased weight doesn't matter or, or does matter, I should say. And yeah, visceral fat, like, so insulin resistance is part of perimenopause and that's not caused by what you eat or how you eat. It is it is part of the changes in hormones. It's a big 
genetic component to all of this. And so that changes how your body accumulates fat also, which then it creates different inflammatory components and different things depending on where the fat is. It's as much as I hate how much we focus on fat, the research on fat cells as a tissue now is really interesting. For most of the people I work with, they don't want to hear about it because they're still really trying to get to a place where they can be neutral about Of course. It. Yep. They don't want to talk about this. I, I agree. I just think it's important for us to understand our, our bodies at the same time. So I, I completely agree with that where they're at, but hopefully someone might find this interesting on this, on this kind of chat, right? In case anyone's watching, it's not a conversation that has to be had, right? The can still, even this stuff can be super triggering for people. Yeah. Uh, which is, it's hard and it's disappointing. But again, it's because of this. I used the word fat at the conference and I watched a person visibly cringe because uh, mm -hmm. we were talking about risk factors and uh, I think it was specifically about breast disease uh, and, and breast cancer. And so it's, it's more prevalent in people over a certain BMI. And uh, I said, well, like, is that because they don't get detected because nobody touches fat people? And she mm. just, Ooh. and I was like, oh, right. I'm not, I'm not amongst I'm not amongst my peers right now where we, you and I use fat as a neutral job. I'm a small fat. Yes. I'm not offended. You call me fat and I am not going to get up in arms about it. But that was not the case. And I, it, it reminded me in a, in a very shocking way, just this late stigma piece and how profound it is. Like, it, absolutely. Really, I, I am isolated and insulated a little bit on purpose with the people. Yeah. Uh, so it was. Well, and I think that's, the frustrating thing you know like as well right because everything is is related back to weight right so again i hear it all the time from my clients like either they get dismissed with anxiety or you know it's you just go home you know exercise more and and eat less right that's kind of the messaging and then you'll be healthy right but and and again a lot of these things that happen in perimenopause you know like if, again i have a thyroid issue right like there is research to show that people with thyroid issues you know, tend to have higher cholesterol levels. It can affect, you know, other other things as well, right? I'm, I actually, my cholesterol is okay, but I'm saying it can. But if you look at the research on perimenopause, blood pressure, cholesterol, like lipid panel, general changes, right? I'm sure you can speak to that more. But again, it all gets just put down to, well, it's because of your weight, yeah. right? You just need to go and, and lose weight. But again, what are the consequences of of that, right? Yeah. And, and does it actually work? Because I think from, you know, most of us, what I see with my clients is they have spent years dieting, right? So the cyclical cycle, you know, and over time, like, again, like in the short term, yes, dieting can, can work. But I think the more we diet, actually, as we get older, the harder it actually gets to, to have the same result. And then it's the rebound effect, right? So then, you know, a lot of us, like, you know, 95 to 97% of us tend to regain the weight and more, right? So I see clients coming into their mid to late 30s, 40s. They're like, I've dieted all my life. I'm, I'm, I'm a higher weight than I was, you know, when I, when I started all this dieting, why hasn't it worked? And now it, these things aren't working anymore for me. And my doctor's telling me, you know, I need to go and lose more weight, but I, and I need to do these things, but I actually feel worse. And I know, correct me if I'm wrong, but I was looking at research on, you know, restrictive diets, right. You know, like very restrictive calorie diets. And, you know, what they're finding now is that it can actually worsen hormonal issues and like obviously the inflammatory stress response in our body. So like, what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I was doing, I have so many thoughts from all the things that you just said. Sorry. <laughs> Too, I'm, I'm like, blah, 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 no, it's it. And like, yeah. first and foremost, though, like semi-starvation is incompatible with life, right? So a diet that severely restricts your calories is not sustainable. It cannot be by definition, right? So it's absurd that we continue to do this. And I, when I read the research, I'm like, I don't know why we're still doing research on this. It is not sustainable. It's not compatible with life. Can we please stop? And the other thing I wanted to just throw out there that I say to patients all the time or non-patients who are arguing with me about this stuff, they're like, but weight loss, like, okay, let's, let's decide that we're going to agree that it helps. I'm not. But for the sake of argument, let's say weight loss is the end. Fine. Again, not sustainable for the vast majority of people. 
the vast majority of people cannot maintain any significant weight loss for very long. So even if it were the answer, it's like saying, you know, guess what, Charlotte, we have a solution. You just have to touch the surface of the moon and you're going to be fine, mm -hmm. right? Well, great. Maybe that is the answer, but how am I getting there to do that? Like it yeah. just works. So let's stop talking. All of that weight cycling, we were talking about body composition and visceral fat. Like every time that you do one of these weight loss strategies, your body changes the way it stores fat and it increases visceral fat. And so it's, there's just so much damage being done. And again, that informed consent piece is just, it's not there. They're not yeah. talking about all these things that could happen. Yep. And totally forgotten the actual question. No, no, but, you know, but again, it's, it's like you said, it's that rebound effect, not just in terms of our, our weights from dieting. It, it's also like, again, it does have changes in our body. And, you know, I, I was, you know, actually speaking with like, you know, my naturopath who, who focuses in, on like PCOS and other things. And she was talking about this research on very restrictive diets and how, you know, those of us with hormonal issues, not even talking about menopause, it can actually worsen things over time. Right. And, and again, when you think about nutrient deficiencies as well, like a lot of us who have autoimmune conditions or, or hormonal issues anyway, even before we hit perimenopause, you know, it obviously can, can worsen those things. And, and again, as we get older, you know, I think I was reading a paper actually, and they were saying like, you know, seniors who intentionally diet, you know, and we're talking like above 70, I think it's about a 40% higher um, mortality rate than, than the average population because of things like hip fractures and other kind of, you know, secondary things, right? And also if they're having illnesses or surgeries, right? They're actually finding in research now that people who are, you know, a little bit on the heavier side, right? They actually, you know, do better in recovery from heart attacks and surgeries and other things as they get older because, again, when we're, when we're losing weight so quickly, it's not just fat we're losing, right? It's, it's, you know, nutrients and bone density. And especially, you know, again, the research is all, a lot of been, of it been done on men, right? Not with our hormonal profile. So now that we're starting to see this research coming about showing that actually we're kind of working against ourselves because being strong as we age and, and keeping our mobility and our bone density, that is such an important thing, right? The, the changes in the quality of life after a fracture when people are over 60 is absolutely astonishing. And Anna from Body Positive Fitness, her and I did an interview a while ago, and that was one of the things we really talked about was like, if you hate exercise and you're just not going to do it, practice one thing, and that's get up and down off the floor every day yep. in whatever way and keep doing that. Yes. And it's really keeping yourself on your feet and being able to so balance exercises things like that are that they're just they're they're under appreciated because they don't burn calories yeah. right and these are exercises that are going to result in weight loss but are exercises that are going to result in a, a massive improvement in your quality of life and reducing your fractures and that's that's really important as we get older. But again, all of these benefits and all of these, and it, it gets lost in the conversation because of the weight movement, right? Yeah. And we did with, yes, and stretching, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Natalie was confident. Yeah, stretching is super important because, again, it keeps flexibility and that mobility if we're stiffened out, right? Yeah. But what, what diet and wellness culture with the weight stigma take away from us is all of these benefits of these health promoting behaviors because mm -hmm. we see them as not working when our body size is and yeah. and some people stop you know eating more vegetables or they stop exercising or stretching or moving because well it's not it's not working and that's why i i mean i think i know for me that's why i take a weight neutral approach with my patients and we focus on behavior. Mm -hmm. And and part of that is what you do, which is like, how do we get there when we've had a lifetime of abuse because our body wouldn't do what our doctor told us? Absolutely. And I think you bring up such a great point of like the social determinants of health. Like I encourage anyone watching to go and look those up, right? Because when you think about like our weight, right, that's one very small piece of like a big 
puzzle of what is our health, right? And again, we need to be having more discussions around stress management, you know, like, you know, ways to improve sleep, HRT, you know, hormone replacement therapy options, right? Because again, you know, doctors and, and even gynecologists, right, they get like eight hours of training, you know, in, in their medical career on, on this. And again, a lot of them, it's, it's very hit and miss, right? Like, you know, my wife just went to a gynecologist recently and it was an awful experience. And her doctor doesn't really have a clue. My, you know, a lot of people, you know, and this is stories I hit all the time, right? So, you know, you have to go and do all this research, to try and find someone who can actually like give you these options, right? Because again, it's the dropping off hormones, right? That is causing this change of, you know, sort of muscle and, and fat distribution in our bodies. And that's, you know, that's a big piece of it as well, right? And it may not be right for everyone, but we at least need that informed consent, like you said, to know the options and get you know, that nuanced kind of conversation with, with people, right? And so many doctors are scared of hormone yeah. therapy because of some of the data that came out. Um, was that? It was like 20, 30, yeah, 20 well, years ago, wasn't it? Yeah. Might have been 2012, might, anyways, whatever. There might be one in there, there might not be. But the study came out and, oh my gosh, there's this increased risk of, the, and it freaked people out. And we've done so much more research since then. But again, if you're not actively looking for that research, but if you look at the Canadian guidelines from the Gynecological yep. Association, their guidelines say, right, if someone is under the age of 60, if they are 10 years away from having menopause the last cycle, then it is by far and large a safe intervention mm -hmm. to give uh, with ex obviously which is why we do risk assessments and why we put numbers into calculators and figure out whether or not it's safe for somebody hormone therapy is not appropriate for everybody absolutely yep. but by and large it is safe yep. for people who are asking for it and it's not about how long you're on it it's about when you started it because again that was another one of those misconceptions or it was a misunderstanding of the research and that we thought that you had to, like if you were on it for more than five years so then we are delaying putting people on it mm -hmm. and the benefit of putting people on it earlier is there is more prevention yep uh, heart disease is. prevention alzheimer's prevention like it, the list goes mm -hmm. on right there's so many things and so we we don't have to be scared to have women on it yeah um, or people on it for longer than five years it's really when they started it and at what age they are so yeah. you know you're talking about putting someone who's 65 and hasn't had a period in 10 years on it that's a very different conversation well those changes have happened right like those those changes to the brain and other things absolutely yeah, yeah. versus having somebody 45 who would like to start it because of all of the the struggles that they're having and it really affects the quality of life I and mean, i'm absolutely current experiencing it myself and it, it's mind-boggling now I mean I yeah it's re remarkable well and that's the piece right like you know it's like you know I've had clients who have never felt anxious in their life right and then suddenly they're like what the hell's going on with me like I don't you know I'm feeling anxious I'm struggling with confidence I don't want to you know like things like driving you know at night anymore or you know even go to the grocery store you know and also like I have clients who you know again you know because I work with a lot of, you know, ADHD and, and autistic folks, you know, you know, who have PMDD, like, you know, that sort of, you know, so they can get very even suicidal before their periods. Right. But it's the drop, it's the change, the, the, the change in the hormones very quickly. So again, they hit menopause and suddenly, you know, you've got people who've never had suicidal ideation or anything in their life and they're feeling awful. And, you know, the doctor's like, well, here, here's an antidepressant, right? And I'm not saying antidepressants aren't helpful, but again, we're missing the point of, you know, that shouldn't, because of, like you said, the misinformation from the, the, that, tw that study 20 years ago, which was shown to be flawed, you know, now like the rates of like first line intervention for, you know, women getting, you know, and AFAB people getting antidepressants as a first line treatment for menopause. Again, it's, it's missing, missing the point sometimes, right? Sometimes. Yeah. And I also want to point out that like even if you have zero history of mental health challenges in your life you are four times more likely than the average person to experience it during perimenopause 
So it is very possible that antidepressant medications could help. You. Absolutely. Right? It could yep. be a, a wonderful support. There are also natural things yep. that we can offer for the same reasons. Um, and that's fantastic, especially for people who hormone therapy is absolutely not appropriate for, right? Yep. So, yeti, glad we have them. Yep. And Agreed. we have bigger conversation but again in Ontario anyways what is it like seven minutes that a medical doctor spends with their patient yeah like you can't talk about your mental health your sleep your osteoporosis a risk assessment for falling your cardiovascular just like there's a lot of things to talk about mm -hmm. and seven minutes is not going to cut it right so and again I do understand like the you know obviously the the system right is is broken and, you know, it, we're not exactly incentivizing doctors to get into private practice. A lot of them are shutting down right now and then the pandemic and everything else. Right. So I'm, I do have a lot of empathy for, you know, medical practitioners. I just find that when it comes to, you know, sort of, you know, hormone health and cro more chronic health issues. Right. Especially when they affect women and AFAB people more there's a real disconnect right in the training that they receive and and the nuanced understanding of these of these things yeah. natalie was just asking yeah. how would you recommend talking to doctors about this and you know the input the misinformation based on this old research and basically advocating for for hrt kind of thing there are some some pretty good position papers out right now i don't know you can't link to stuff Maybe we can add some links afterwards to the video, but there are some decent, like, yeah, position papers that have been summarized that are from, you know, the governing bodies or at least the, like, associations that are recommending what the standards of care should be. And sometimes bringing that in can help in getting a referral to somebody who is comfortable with it. Yeah. Many naturopaths in Ontario can prescribe bioidentical hormones. There's some limitations with what that can do also. So really, like if we can get a nurse practitioner or a medical doctor or somebody on board yeah. to do the prescribing, it is is definitely more efficient. One thing that some of the things I suggest to clients as well, and I should have done this when we were looking at my, my wife's specialist, but we didn't because I didn't think about it in my own life. But, you know, basically, like I go on some of the menopause groups on I'm on Facebook because, you know, as much as Facebook's sort of like for a lot of people is like, you know, older generation, actually, they're saying in terms of that, those community supports. Right. Um, because you can go on those pages and a lot of times people are asking for specialist recommendations and people will put up like in the GTA Ontario area. Right. Like who who they've been to that they've had a positive experience because there are some. Uh, specialists out there that have done the extra homework yes. and have read the books and are following, you know, the people online, the doctors online that are really trying to push this, you know, the menopause cause, right? But it's trying to find those people. And then what I also suggest is like, if you find a couple of people, like go on Rate MD and look up the reviews for for those people, because that will, gen again, you always get like sometimes on every doctor, like the odd one that's not happy, but you can generally see like when I look through some of them, like some of them are pretty awful, <laughs> the reviews, right? So you can kind of get an idea very quickly if that person's going to be okay. And then go to your GP and say like, if you don't understand this, because like when, you know, I've had people go to GPs and they're like, oh no, HRT doesn't protect anything. It doesn't, it doesn't help with, with these things, right? At least you can kind of advocate for yourself and say, you know, I want to be referred to you know, one of these people to, you know, and, and, and even sometimes, right, using these online platforms to see a doctor as well, just to get a referral. If you, you know, generally your doctor shouldn't be refusing you, but if, if they are, then, then you, you can try and use one of the online platforms. I hate having to do that because you have to pay for it, but, you know, sometimes you need to, to do it kind of thing. Yeah. Menopause.org, the North American Menopause Association, and they have there, the number of people being going through their certification program is increasing year over year. Yeah. So that might be a resource to potentially find a path for somebody who might be able to help support yep. that question. I would also say, like, sometimes I do obviously, you know, sort of, sort of talk to clients about like going to a naturopath because again, a lot of doctors will only do like, for instance, like with thyroid, right? Like we're, we're you know, we're a much more likely kind of 
time of, of hormonal transition to develop like autoimmune conditions, which will all, can also kind of factor into this discussion as well. And, you know, I have a thyroid issue and like doctors will just test my TSH like over and over, which doesn't tell me if I have an autoimmune condition and, and other things. Right. But so I say, we'll go, you know, maybe go get tested with a naturopath because at least do you know, more in-depth blood work, like nutrient deficiencies and other things. My only concern is that, and I, I always kind of caution clients, right, when they go looking for naturopaths as well, because again, a lot of, of them are tied with the wellness culture as well and, and, and have weight stigma and, and unfortunately as well. And I've had some clients have some, you know, pretty, who've been in recovery from eating disorders, have some pretty not so helpful conversations with naturopaths either. So again, if they start telling you to like cut things out and do all these kind of like, you know, really kind of restrictive diet. I'm not saying in some instances with some health issues, you, you might have to do some things, but it's a very, I think you have to be really, really careful with that. Like, you know, like, you know, again, if I'm having a histamine issue where I'm having anaphylactic shock, obviously I might want to cut something out of my diet. Right. But I mean, I'm talking about like on general levels, if they start telling you to cut out food groups, that really kind of scares me as an eating disorder therapist. Right. So I had a patient years ago, she had seen me because my practice used to focus on fertility and she had seen me during her fertility years. And then when I stepped away from that and really stepped into the health of every size and intuitive eating and all the associated conditions with that, she had gone to one of, she'd gone to another naturopath who was focusing with PCOS and she plunk. I will never forget the stick. She just like, it was a very dramatic plunk in the chair and she's like, I hope no one's offended. She's like, these fucking natural. <laughs> She's like, no offense, Carrie. I'm like, none taken. But this, here is this woman who had just had a baby and she had a toddler and she was being told to cut out, I don't know, like it was sugar and flour and dairy and, and like it was, it was an exhaustive list. Not to mention the hundreds of dollars of supplements that she was encouraged to buy. And this is one visit with this doctor and, yeah. and I, man, you have missed so many marks here of, of appropriate care. And, and as the, I was told in, I'm still in school, Brian Timothy, rest in peace. Like I was awesome. But he said, Carrie, there's no such thing as a non-compliant patient. It was a bad treatment. Plan. If they yeah. can't do what you ask them to do, you didn't meet them part way. You didn't listen to what they have to say, or you don't understand their obstacles. Yeah. I mean, I think that's why I love the work that I do. And I know that's part of why you love what you do, right? We spend time with and we, you know, it's not about like if if I say to someone, you know what, exercise is a really helpful intervention for osteoporosis, strength training in particular. Mm -hmm. There's a ton of evidence for that. But if you have a horrible relationship with exercise, that is not like that is gonna stir up the worst yeah, that someone needs yeah. to un and work through, right? And they need a safe place to do that. And it's nice that there's more of us around now. We're still hard to find and we are not free. And it's not the general, you know, like you mentioned about exercise, right? Like, you know, it's hard to find spaces. I mean, they're, they're popping up a bit more now, right? But a lot of us have trauma from exercise, at, you know, kind of places, right? Because you are so fully judged on you know, again, you can't win, right? Like it's like even things like having clothing for exercise while you're promoting obesity. And then on the other hand, you're not doing anything, you know, you're lazy, like get off your butt, right? And it's like, but you know, who wants to go to, you know, the gym and, and be judged, right? But also, you know, working with a lot of clients with chronic illness and, and even like I used to be extremely sporty when I was younger, right? Like I was on every sports team, lot very athletic, right? And I just find like, you know, as I've, you know, got, older with my thyroid issue and things like that like I have to be careful like what kinds of exercise I do because I get like a you know you know there's a bit of exercise intolerance there with the with the autoimmune condition I don't think people understand that for for a lot of us that have us who are spooning is right it's not such an easy you know relationship with movement and exercise it's not always going to be an enjoyable experience and we're always trying to sort of walk this fine line between knowing things like you said, like walking and other, and other weight bearing exercises are good for, you know, bone density and muscle mass and all these things. And, um, trying to balance that with, you know, exercises that, you know, all types of movement that we don't get like the, the rebound effect after we do 
the exercise or yeah. movement, right? So it's it's tough to, to to and doctors don't kind of understand or or a lot of people don't understand that. They just think, oh, you're just not trying hard enough, you're lazy, you know, go away and just do better, right? Because that's still capitalistic kind of mentality, right? Shame and blame culture of, you know, if someone's struggling, it couldn't just be like obviously that there's systemic issues, kind of barriers and misunderstanding. It's you just go away and, and do better, right? So if you want yeah. it bad enough, you'll yeah. make it happen. Do it. Yeah. No. Yeah. And that, yeah. that's the thing no. with the mental health piece, right, is trying to unpack all of the years and years and years of, of that. And then you hit perimenopause and your body's doing things that you can't, you know, you, you know, you're not in control of anymore, right? And, 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 and then you're like, you know, your mental health goes in the toilet because of that as well, right? Yep. Yeah. And we're, you yeah. know. Again, being told that I might get kicked off in five minutes, according to my phone. Um, oh, okay. Forgot to undo my social media li limit on. Oh, okay, that's okay. I have a self-imposed one-hour limit. But anyways, we we understand that biologically, our body is going to change in body composition, just like it did when we entered puberty. Mm -hmm. And we are supposed to fight it with everything and really there's just not enough con there's not enough conversation about consent and 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 what we yeah um and it's it's dangerous and it is. and to circle back to where we started which is the prevalence of eating disorders amongst people going through the perimenopause yeah. are are it's dangerously high and and it's very distressing for their life and their family and their just ability to go and enjoy anything mm -hmm. and it's really problematic and all of this is because god forbid you might gain some weight mm -hmm. yeah i agree and and just this kind of idea of like a one size thing fits all mentality and it's you know again like you know not realizing that we are complex beings right yeah, one of the notes I had made on the weekends was, you know, there's risk, there's the risk of, and then there's your risk. And you want to work with someone who's going to help you figure out your risks, yeah. not the 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 is population-based, and that, that doesn't apply to you. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. Well, I guess uh, we'll wrap up a little bit early, seeing as your uh, phone's oh. going to conk out soon. So, oh. yeah. But I, yeah. Yeah, I'll stay on for a little bit and see if anyone has any questions. But, you know, I'll, so thank you very much for, for joining me today, Kerry. And maybe we'll have more conversations about this. But hopefully for a few people who've joined today, they've they've got some information that will be helpful to them. It was fun, as always. Love chatting with you. Same to you. Okay, I'll see you soon. Later. Bye.